when I'm working technique, it means I'm going race technique, speed technique. Mm. I'm going fast. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting, let's say I'm hitting eight sevens, eight eights on, mm. uh, on 25 yards. You know, so that's, that's pretty fast. And that's when I work my technique because I, I, I mean, it, there's no point about working on your slow technique since you're not going slow during a race. Welcome to Social Kick. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew today. Luke Paddington, Dr. John Mullen, and from Sao Paulo, Bruno Fratis. What's up, Bruno? How's it going? Hey, how's it going, guys? Finally, we got to talk, eh? Yeah, yeah. dude, I'm pumped. I mean, you and I crossed paths years ago in Auburn, and um, you've uh, you've been on quite a tear in your career since then. It's been fun to watch, and looking forward to being able to to catch up here and share some time with you. But first, talk about uh, you know the what you're doing right now. I understand you know in Brazil and have gone through uh, another injury rehab. So walk us through what's what's going on. What are you up to right now? I'm uh, fixing my shoulders again. When, when you've been swimming straight arm freestyle for something about 15 years and swim over 120 ones, that's, uh, that's gonna, <laughs> that's gonna get you eventually. <laughs> so I'm here. I just went through my third shoulder surgery and uh, Dr. John's going to be able to, to, Take care of you. to explain a little bit and, and, and to talk about it. But yeah, just been rehabbing for the past four or five months. What is the nature of the injuries that you've gone through? And have they been the same, same shoulder, both shoulders? Um... Uh, both shoulders. Now I've done, uh, I've done a procedure called a thinodesis on both shoulders. Is when they cut the tendon off the biceps and they put a screw inside your bone. They just cut it and screw it back in. So I have it on both my shoulders. Also, my two subscapulars have been redone. My supraspinatus have been redone. And uh, on this last one, my third one, my pack muscle has been reattached too. Yeah, quite a quite a rehab, uh, that's for sure. And quite an injury history there. But as you said, when you're swimming straight arm freestyle, you're creating obviously a ton of force with such a, a long lever arm. It, it's going to be putting you under that that stress, no doubt about it. So where exactly are you in, in the process of recovery? What types of things are they doing with you? And are you in the water at all? And if not, when do you hope to get back in? Uh, yes, I just recently came back in the water. Um, I would say I'm just uh, a little bit less than five degrees from, from perfect right now in terms of range of motion from every direction. And uh, I am uh, maybe a couple, three weeks away from uh, from being able to go back to training full force. But that's the thing, right? Straight on freestyle is something that is very exciting. It goes really fast. It's really powerful, but it hurts a lot. It can be very dangerous. And we're not only talking about the straight arm recovery, but the straight arm pull as well. Uh, Brian's going to be able to remember Fred Busquet. He used to – he was one of the guys who started the trend. Right. So the way the way straight arm freestylers swim, the the stroke becomes almost ballistic. Right. It makes it basically makes swimming uh, impact sports, just like mm -hmm. running, jogging, sprinting, whatever. So, yeah, again, it, it can hurt you. You know, I was having a conversation recently with a guy, Will Copeland, who's uh, he runs a, a swim business with Nathan Adrian in California. And he I think actually you, he and I were all at the same meet at 2011 Pan American Games, too, oddly enough. And um, recently I was having a swim with him and Nathan Adrian. We were talking about um, this spot in our elbow that is always problematic, like right here in the elbow. And I said, yeah, I always have this issue right here whenever I put a lot of pressure on the water. And he was saying, hey, yeah, actually, that's so crazy you say that because I have the exact same problem. And I've heard some other people say it, too. And, you know, when you when you learn from the best or you watch other people develop their stroke mechanics, they're all doing a, a very similar thing. And so it's it's easy to understand that, you know, we would have some similar injuries happening. Bodies are different for sure. But like there's kind of that camaraderie of like, yeah, this freaking hurts and you're putting a lot of pressure on it over time. Yeah, it does. That makes you respect the other swimmers who, who race you. Right. But sports, of course, there's a connection between sports and health, right. And good health, but the closer you get to performance, the further you get from, from healthy, right. From being healthy. 
I mean, physically, mentally, emotionally, it, it takes a it takes a huge toll. And if you want to swim fast, if you want to be an Olympian, if you want to work with performance, you're gonna to have to sacrifice a few things. One being your your um, your mechanical health. Let's put it that way. Bruno, do you feel like at this point you've got um, a pretty good understanding of when this uh, the symptoms are going to start to happen? Because if you have longevity in your career, I mean, you're still you're still a, a young guy. I mean, Irvin won a gold medal at 35, and you know your your uh, your countryman Nick Santos is still cranking away at 42. 42 right? Just, just retired, uh, yeah. just wrapped it up, right? But um, you know, do you feel like you've got a pretty good sense of your body and when things are starting to go awry beforehand and and know like, okay, it's time for surgery. Usually when it hurts so bad that I cannot swim anymore. So that's when you need to go to surgery. But I mean, pain, pain is just part of, of your daily routine as a, as a performance athlete. Right. And I just think it's, um, it's, it's too much to expect, for you not to feel any pain when you're training to to be the best to race right let me there you go no problem. <laughs> so uh, you cannot expect to to prepare to be one of the best in the world to be number one and not expect to feel any pain so that's just part of part of the program almost but when things start to because it's okay to be sore it's okay to be hurting but being uh, being being away from your best uh, performance, being unable to perform swimming, to perform your stroke, that's when things get start getting dangerous. Bruno, I ask you about how do you deal with it mentally, though? You're like shit again, you know. Like it's you know you're thirty, what two years, three years old right now. It's like you know. Is, is it going to come back? What gives you the confidence and the, the motivation and, 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 the, and the grit to get through it emotionally and, and, and overcome it? Like knowing it's going to be good and you'll be fine and you're sorted. Uh, it's just what I have to do. It's just yeah. what I have to do. Uh, I do not believe in feeling sorry for myself. So that kind of mentality, like, damn, am I going to have to go through all that again? I mean, it's just, it's just part of what you do when, again, when you're preparing yourself at such high level, you are prone to injuries, you, you assume the risk, the risk of hurting yourself. So, yeah, I'm not really into feeling sorry for myself or dragging myself through, through things. It's just what I have to do. I have to get my body ready again, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, I think it's uh, all, all too common for anyone that, you know, has an injury at, at your level to think that, or I guess well, other people when they're watching, they think, oh, Olympic athletes, professional athletes, they're the epitome of health. But like you alluded to, you've been doing this for a while, especially when you're doing it in a sprint event. And we think, oh, sometimes it's a distance somewhere as they're putting on the volume. But the sprinter, especially the straight arm catch phase is putting so much stress on your body. You're going to have injuries throughout the way. So I think it is crucial that, like I said, you find a way to, like like Luke was alluding to, get yourself mentally, you know, prepared for that. And it sounds like you are able to move past that. But I'd love to know when you are going through a surgery and you have time out of the water, are you still trying to work on other things out of the pool, whether that is that mental side of things or other strength avenues? Uh, yeah, I, I try to remain not completely strict, but I try to remain disciplined in my diet, in my sleeping, my recovery. Uh, the rehab itself, the physical therapy itself, it is part of training, right? You don't, you don't suddenly stop being an athlete. So going through surgery and getting out of surgery and starting rehab at the, at the PT office, uh, you're still an athlete. You're still a high-level athlete, and you're still working towards a goal and towards performance. So it's uh, for me, it's just like training. You know, as I said, it's just part of what I do. It's uh, it's what I have to do right now. My goal right now is to get my body ready again. So the, the entire discipline that that I like to have when I'm actually training, I, I bring to my rehab. Bruno, Brian and I were talking about you seem like the guy who has a, has a formula to hit, to get 21. You, you just know what you need to get there. 
But surely that formula tweaks and evolves constantly. You just mentioned some of the ways that you've you've improving your nutrition, your sleep, uh, your your health. Um, let's talk about the straight arm freestyle. The straight arm freestyle get a little bit technical with us right now. As a straight arm freestyle that Bruno swam six years ago, how is that different to the one you swim now? The uh, hips, the catch, the push. The there's not a lot of difference per se. I'll focus. I'll focus a lot about efficiency, and and the training, the strength training is still really present every day. Mm-hmm. The difference is uh, I don't hit that level of race intensity so often nowadays. It becomes easier for me to be fast and to be powerful and to perform mm-hmm. that specific uh, movement pattern. So I don't have to repeat that so many times during my week like I had to do when I was 19, 20 years, years of age. So I pretty much dominate the technique nowadays. And, and uh, of course, being older, I have, to, I have to spend more time recovering, right? So things balance itself. What do you think the percentages of uh, a strong 25 straight arm versus the rest of the workout being pretty technique based and easy going and just working on, on on technique. What do you think that percentage is on average when you're healthy? There's not there's not a lot of there's not a lot of slow swimming. Mm. Uh, there's I mean I don't do double. It's been about three four years that I don't do doubles anymore. I barely do Saturdays because there's no point about going at that level at that point. There's no point about going to the pool to perform slow swimming, you know, mm-hmm. like zone one, zone two aerobic swims or even long swims. I mean, it just, it just becomes pointless to me. And when I'm working technique, it means I'm going race technique, speed technique. Mm-hmm. I'm going fast. I'm, I'm, I'm hitting, let's say I'm hitting eight sevens, eight eights on, mm-hmm. uh, on 25 yards, you know, so that's that's pretty fast. And that's when I work my technique because I I, I mean it, there's no point about working on your slow technique since you're not going slow during a race. You know, so it's it is extremely I know it can sound a little odd, but I we're just going more and more straight specific. What's the feedback loop? Uh, do you have um, you know somebody there filming you, and how much how much are you using that versus feel uh, to to give you that feedback on the technical side? The, the best feedback you can get is the stopwatch. So if you're hitting times and if you're going faster, uh, that's good feedback. So if you're starting starting to slow down, if you're starting to get sloppy, mm-hmm. and you feel you have to have the discipline to feel and uh, and and being able to admit when you're going starting to get a little sloppy in the water. Mm-hmm. So that's the best feedback you can get. I think over analyzing things, it's not it's not super helpful. It's it never been to me actually. Mm-hmm. So it's good it's good for younger swimmers and all. I used to love I used to love to get to get video footage and um, and outside feedback when I was younger. But nowadays, I just I don't know. My thing is just go go to the pool, sprint until I cannot sprint anymore, and then go uh-huh. home have dinner and sleep. Dude, that sounds, it sounds easy to, to I, I bet there are swimmers listening to this, uh, especially folks that are stuck in the distance group and, you know, never get to go in this. But, it, time it, going, easy, hey. but that's, it sounds easy because it is easy. I mean, I'm not saying it is easy to go so many 21s and all, but at some point it becomes automatic, you know, at some point yeah. you just start to listen to your body. But I truly, truly, I cannot stress it enough, but I do think we are underdeveloped as a sport in terms of science of training, in terms of um, technique analysis, in terms of everything that involves a sport. Uh, swimming still is still in the in the Stone Age, you know. So we have so we have sprinters swimming five k sessions, four uh, k, three k sessions, you know, while. I go to the pool, I swim barely a mile once a day, and I sprint and I lift heavy and I can go 21 loads. You know, so you have a lot of work until you get to that point. But once you get your sprint, your power going, it's it's not that hard, honestly. It's all about you know what you have to do, you know what you want to feel, and you just pursue that. 
Bruno, I remember uh, when we crossed paths, it must have been like 2010 or 2011. Uh, this is before that you moved to Auburn to train full time. And I, I remember one thing from that interaction. Um, and we were talking about technique. And you, you told me that you think about, at least at the time, that you were thinking about uh, turning your body into a surfboard. And that you were so uh, rigid and um, there was an anchor point for you to, to rotate from. But, but I, I always remember you saying, yeah, like core, everything is just turned into a surfboard. And then you're boom, 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 rotating straight arm around that. Is that, did you continue to think about that? What are some of the things that you do in training to reinforce that? Yeah, that's, that's a sprinting, right? That's basic sprinting because when you're swimming distance, let's say, because we come from a distance background, right? There are no, let's start from the point that there's, there are no uh, sprint events in swimming. They're all resistance. They're all endurance events. My event, it's a power endurance event. <laughs> While when you swim 800 a mile, you're just having aerobic endurance events. Mm -hmm. So when you're swimming longer events, it's almost like you put your arm here and you slide and you catch water, right? While what we're trying to do in sprinting, it's the opposite. We're catching water from above and we're climbing on top of the water. Mm -hmm. So that's more efficient when you think of your hips as a board because you have to be, I like to call it climbing on top of the water on average stroke and not gliding through water. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the main difference between strokes. Gary Hall, uh, it's not... I think it's Gary Hall Sr. or Mike Bottom, but that whole uh, race club crew mm -hmm. back from 2000, the early 2000s, they used to talk about the shoulder driven and the hips driven. Mm -hmm. So that's that's basically what it is. Yeah, I think you're touching on some huge points. And obviously with the sport of swimming, there is so much room to improve on the science side as well as the training side. You know, when you hear about specificity, a lot of times people think, oh, well, you know, I'll just work swimming fast and then I'll do all my drills super slow. But we know how skills are, you know, organized in our brain is with speed. And we all know sprint swimming is way different technically than even moderate swimming. So yeah. to hear you talk about, you know, sprinting is, is I think in line with the science, but we're just not seeing it on the coaching side still, even with some top level sprinters. What? You can, you can see what uh, Ben Proud does. He does it really well, this slower drills. When I'm talking about slow drills or fast drills, doesn't necessarily mean uh, tempo, right? Mm -hmm. So what Ben Proud does, he puts a pair of fins. He goes a little faster through the water because of his kicking, but he's moving his arms slow. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily need to be having a, a fast tempo, but you need to be moving through the water slow because then your drag changes and your and your buoyancy changes with speed in the water. So that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. Hmm. Yeah, I think that all, all makes logical sense. Obviously, the swim community doesn't always use logic when it comes to sprint um, workouts and things like that. But yeah. um, maybe if you could just tell us more about maybe an example practice that you might do because like you said you aren't doing a, a whole lot of yardage but i think maybe putting a an example set out there might give some people a better picture of what you actually do in the water what i actually do in the water something curious is uh how i like to to work aerobic endurance right uh a really good set that uh michelle my coach and my wife came up with uh in this past couple of years was uh four rounds of 2025s that's a short course yards mm -hmm. where we do the first it's every time it's one on one off. Right. So we're, you do one fast and when you come back, you're not going easy, but you're going at about 80%, 70% speed. Mm -hmm. So pretty efficient. Mm -hmm. So what we do the first round, it's a uh, freestyle. And on the way back, you can have only two breaths Actually, on the way in and the way back, two breaths, since we're talking short course yards. And then the second round, we do the way in butterfly, the way back backstroke. Then we're doing a third round of um, freestyle and on the way back uh, breaststroke with a dolphin kick and fence. Mm -hmm. 
And then on the fourth round, we take the fins off. Uh, the second and the third round, you have fins on. On the fourth round, you take your fins off. And uh, you go 20, 25 um, freestyle best average. And the interval on those, it's uh, five seconds in the wall. Whoa. So that's pretty much five, uh, four or five hundreds, right? So it's a 2K workout. How fast are you going and how are you feeling on the last 10? On the last 10, I try to hit 10 lows. Mm -hmm. 10 lows nine highs from a push mm -hmm. and that's and that's the whole workout there's no warm-up i mean we just do a small quick dry land warm-up on the on the outside of the pool and um really really quick uh cool down after that if we're doing any cool down i mean maybe yeah. that's maybe i'm having so many shoulder surgeries but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we it's working it. If it's working, it ain't broken, right? Exactly. Listen, you, you talked about the best feedback for you was a, was, a, was a clock. But then you talked about, you know, making sure your hips are high. You talk about your technique, working with your, with your coach and your wife. Um, the newest member of the 21 Second Club is, is Renzo, your buddy Renzo. You know, huge kudos to him. And he was your training partner for a while. Do you need to have a training partner? And if so, why? Is it for feedback, for racing, to keep you going, or just company? Or, or it doesn't really matter, you like it, you don't need it, both are fine. Talk about training partners. I, I like to have training partners, but I like to have racers at training partners, right? I don't need to have them. I actually, <laughs> actually most of the week, I wish I don't have any training partners because I just want to quiet I, I enjoy silence during practice you know huh. i mean working out uh, training training with the with the crew in auburn was was amazing but after four years there i just needed silence during my workout hmm. you know and um having a training partner it is positive but it has to be a racer you know yeah. uh having renzo as a training partner was amazing it was great he's actually i think he's probably the best training partner i ever had because that kid was ready to go every single day and uh, training, I had the I had the opportunity of training with Senator Condorelli and Dylan Carter, also eventually in uh, in South Florida. And these guys are they're true racers, you know. So I like to have a very good few training partners that um, that help me take the best out of myself every day. Brian and John, I'd like to make a note. Renzo has trained a lot in Trinidad. Dylan is from Trinidad. Bruno says his best training partners have a Trinidad base. You guys are lucky to train with me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> you know, thank ourselves every day we race. Yeah, hey, just, <laughs> hey, man, it's just that immigrant mentality. Yeah, you know? Exactly, you see? <laughs> hey, I want to know, Bruno, um, you know, to have a successful career for somebody as long as you have, you have to, you have to develop this um uh, like extreme professionalism but also a understanding of yourself and what and what you need and and it's like i think that from the outside your career has taken that arc where you have different coaching influences but you're also able to recognize what you need yourself um what your body needs and make sure that you prioritize that into your training program and like stick to that and that's that that's clearly benefited you um did you learn that along the way? Have you always had that sort of independence? I don't know. It kind of came. It kind of came naturally. You know, I had bad. I had really good um, coaches in the beginning of my career who constantly talked about specificity, and uh, I think I learned that from a very early age. And then it just became kind of obvious to me that if if something's not working for me, I just have to change because in the end of the day, I'm going to be by myself on the block. Mm -hmm. And if I don't feel ready, nobody's going to be there for me to to help me or to save me. You know, in the end of the day, it's just me by myself about to race at the Olympic final. So if I'm not 100 percent confident. I need to change. I need to pursue whatever makes me confident, you know, because it doesn't matter if you have the best coach in the world, the best preparation in the world. If you don't believe that, if you don't buy that program, you know, and if you don't feel confident with that, that's not going to work. I want to, I want to pivot now to your results. Cause you, 
confidence, I'm sure, is a huge thing for you um, in in the difference in your experiences from from Rio to to Tokyo, and um, you know the the pressure of the world on you in your in your hometown or home province uh, or state there in Rio, and the crowd chanting your name. I mean, you could watch the video, and it's so loud. <laughs> to hear everybody chanting your name. It's, I can't imagine what that must have been like in person. Um, what were the mental things that you took away in terms of how you need to prepare to be successful and deliver a performance in the final from Rio to Tokyo? That's, uh, that's something you build every day, right? In, in Rio, I wasn't mentally ready for that moment. Actually, that the whole team wasn't. You know, if you watch every race from from the Brazilian team, I the worst thing that could have happened to us in 2016 mm -hmm. was to have home games. Yeah, because out of the sudden, everybody was just desperate. Everybody was feeling kind of feeling the pressure to have the best performance ever, mm -hmm. and that was the only thing that the whole leadership leadership of the of the team will talk about mm -hmm. and we forgot to just race we forgot to be ready we were so uh, i mean our heads are so over the clouds you know as we say in portuguese that uh, we just forget we just forgot to do the basic hmm. so all that process all that process from rio to tokyo i mean it had a lot of changes i, I started training by myself i started to be coached uh, by both uh, for Tokyo, I was, still, I was still being coached by Brad Hawk and uh, and Michelle at the same time, and I changed in my my strength program, and uh, I had a few changes that made me comfortable, that made me confident, mm -hmm. and uh, I was glad it worked in Tokyo. It worked out. I was there. So, in Rio. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was gonna say I was there in Rio, and I saw your race, and I saw Tiago race, and it, for me as a swimming fan, I loved it. Because this is, I like, frick, this is swimming. This is what swimming should be. But then you're right. I mean, Tiago went out for it and he couldn't hold on and things like this. It, it, the pressure, I cannot believe what the pressure was like. So, yeah, it's um good move to change in the five years between the two. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was crazy because, I mean, the country was just pouring money over sports, right? Mm -hmm. It was just a, it was just an opening shower and it was raining money on top of sports. Mm -hmm. So... But you cannot you cannot buy performance, right? So I think the pressure started building from there, and also there was like this lack of actual organization, like that things were not that organized. Uh, we came for training camp in São Paulo here, but for some reason the best swim club, the best facility of the country was not reserved for us. Huh. Some other country had it. And we had to be training during training camp in a swimming pool like 50, 50 minutes from our hotel because we didn't book any swimming pools in advance. And that was crazy because any club wanted to, to collaborate with us and help us and to have and host us. Everybody wanted money. Everybody wanted to be paid more. And that, it, it was just crazy. At the lobby of the hotel, we had a television every single day. Jesus. So it just became this huge circus where you had to do s stupid little silly dances for TV and trivias and q and A. So I believe that in 2016, the last, the very last of our priorities was to actually race, to compete. So we we're just a bunch of clowns in, a, in the circus, right? And uh, when it got to the pool, we started with uh, the relay, the four by one freestyle, and everybody was so excited, but we didn't get any medals. So we turned to the next racers. And then we came to the, I think it was the 100 breast. We had two guys in the finals and no medals. So we turned to the next racers. And then they come the 100 free, the four by two, and so on. And when it came to Tiago's race, and I do think Tiago did what he had to do, he he, he had some butts. He had some balls going on. Oh, the dang. He, he had some. Yeah. And uh, everybody just looked to Tiago and said, hey, you got to save the day, man. Do something, you know? <laughs> and he did it. Yeah. And then everybody turned to me with, I mean, nobody said anything, but everybody turned to me and looked to me 
and looked at me with that panic look. Like, hey, man, you better do something. Other way, we're going to be killed here by the media and everything. Just like what happened. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, it was it was a pretty it was a beautiful experience, but at the same time, it was a very traumatic experience in the in the point of um, of logistics and organization. And I think I learned much more from from uh, sports management and uh, and logistics than from actually racing aspects in that experience. Hmm. It's interesting you mentioned the organization of it too, and I'm not blaming that, but I, you know, I think back when Greece held uh, the European Championships for soccer and they won it because of the home field advantage and they felt the pressure, or Sydney, or how well the Aussies did in 2000, right? And, and they handled that. I don't know how they handle it. Um, my brother sat down in Sydney and he started 203, and he says, my God, he had been to tons of worlds before he had the experience, but he says only halfway through the race, he realized, shit, I'm in the Olympic Games. I need to start cooking. Like he, he was so overwhelmed by the moment and the amount of people. How did how did you feel in was there a point in your fifth day free like you just knew it wasn't working in Rio? And is that possible for you to know there's a point where hey, I'm cooking, or you don't know until you touch? Uh yes. The point was when uh, two, three months away from the games, they wanted to they wanted to overlook our sleep. So they just sent us, they just said, because the finals were supposed to be like at 10, 11 p.m. or something, right? And uh, they just sent us this small little wrist tags that was supposed to control your sleep and read your sleep patterns. And when we got to the game, when we got to, to Brazil to race, I mean, when I got to Brazil, everybody was here ready. They gave us this UV light goggles, Right. Because they were supposed to keep us awake and to put UV light in our eyes and to break the melatonin cycle and you don't feel sleepy late at night. That that's the exact moment when I saw everything going to shit. Mm-hmm. Pardon my French. Just because just because I mean when when people start looking for gimmicks, that's when things go wrong. That's why I talk about spreading with in such natural way because it is simple you're going to perform whatever you train for if you get used to sprinting you're going to sprint well but if you keep doing aerobic stuff and s- slow drills you're going to be good you're going to become good at slow drills and aerobic swimming right and mm-hmm. we started to use these uv goggles and when i saw that i was like man this is not going well because I mean, if you're swimming an Olympic final at 11 p.m. and you're feeling sleepy, I'm yeah. sorry, you're there's something wrong with you. You don't need the goggles. UV goggles are not going to fix your problems, and I have bad news for you. I mean, it could be it could be it could be two, three a.m. If you're swimming Olympic final, you're going to be ready. You make sure you're ready. You have as many espresso shots. You need a as horn. You need, to you, you need a horn. You need as many espresso shots. You need to be smacked in the face. I don't care. You need you need to be kicked in the nuts. You got to make sure you wait. You're waking, right? So that that whole sleeping scenario and trying to control the athlete's awakeness and uh, so and, and here's the fun thing oh my god that's so ridiculous that's actually embarrassing that's embarrassing that's that's embarrassing because uh, when we got to the village they realized they didn't have enough UV goggles for everybody right oh no <laughs> some people suffer. yeah so exactly so they had to choose who what swimmer they wanted to sacrifice. Like, hey, your your performance is not important enough. You're not worrying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we love but you. That's but that's not what happened. They they just got a bunch of UV bulbs, light bulbs, and they put in a room, and they made us and they made us stay inside the room for like forty minutes before we go to the pool. That shit felt like a microwave. Yeah, say <laughs> you, you were just you were just. Dude, you were just like being microwaved and getting skin cancer before your race. <laughs> exactly. so no better man, time, no better time to try it than at the Olympics. Hey, hey, hey yeah. If, if you're, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're gonna appear at, at the TV in uh, at prime time, you better have your ten ready, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
So it was just a huge tiny room, felt like a microwave, and then you went to to the swimming pool. So that whole thing was just. Uh, I think Brett he he defined very well when he said people are just trying too hard. You cannot try mm -hmm. that hard, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's like trying hard. That's trying hard is acceptable, but trying too hard. I mean, you're just squishing Double. that thing and killing it and suffocating it. You know, you have you have to grab it firmly, but you cannot suffocate the air of the thing. You know. Bruno, I, I have to admit, and I, I want to share this just because it, your your story and your experiences are so impactful for anyone who who dedicated their life to an Olympic dream. And um, in preparation for this conversation, obviously we watched a lot of the your racing videos, and I'm not gonna lie, man, I teared up watching uh, you on the, on the medal stand before you're about to receive your medal in Tokyo. It's, it's hard for me not to watch that and cry. And it's, I don't think it's because I, you know, I, and, and, and many of us have like dedicated our lives to pursuing an Olympic dream. And I, I wanted so badly to be an Olympian. And I, I did everything that I, I felt like I possibly could have to be my best. And, and I, and I didn't, it didn't work out for me on that front, but I don't think that's where the tears come from. The, the, the emotions that I feel watching you are a culmination of how hard it is to get to that point and how much you have to sacrifice okay, and how much, so the people, the, how much the people in your lives have to, to, to sacrifice to support you on that journey and it was just so cool man to to see you have that moment as, as somebody who's like watched your your journey um and i feel like you were representative of a lot of people who are pursuing that path and the feeling is just like man like fuck yeah dude you did it like that was just Thanks, so man. awesome I, I, pre I really appreciate your saying all that man i can feel it comes from the heart but can I tell you a secret? You ready for it? Yeah. Being a, having an Olympic medal is cool, but that thing is nothing but a paperweight. In terms of in terms of accomplishment, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you are even more accomplished than I am. Because you were able, because you were able to, you're able to to stop and to feel that how much ever you tried and whatever you tried and the amount of time you spent and dedication you gave to the sport was enough. Hmm. You know, for me, I keep pursuing something. I don't even know what it is because I got my medal. I won races before I broke records before. Of course, I never won Olympic gold. I'd love to, I never broke a world record. I'd love to, but but it keeps, I keep killing myself little by little every day in the inside, looking for something, looking for accomplishment, looking for fulfillment mm -hmm. in, in, in this random paperweight, you know? So what matters the most, and it, it's easy to, it's easy to say, but it's something I still need to feel in my heart for me to be able to actually feel it. But what means the most it's 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 the process you know it's that you try when you say you tried everything you could do you really believe you tried everything you could so yeah you're very accomplished did you give your best did you go to practice every day did you swim with purpose on every single practice did you get frustrated when you get defeated by yourself by your own mentality and did you feel accomplished were you happy when you succeeded so yeah, you're a very, very accomplished swimming swimmer. Mm -hmm. While for myself, I'm still kind of a slave of this pursuit, <laughs> you know? And that's mm -hmm. and that's real. I appreciate everything you're saying. It's super cool to be an Olympic medalist. I love it every day. I love it every bit. But I still I still looking for for fulfillment, you know? And at some level, I'm kind of a, a I'm kind of a slave of this pursuit. You, you guys were not ready for it, eh? 
No, no, no. It's heavy. It's, it's, and I, I feel it. <laughs> it's the um. Yeah. It, it, see, like that. Even if I wanted to stop right now, I couldn't because it but, just put in my head that I need to be an Olympic champion. You know, here I am. Here I am. Three surgeries later, still trying. You know, look at look at the amount of suffering and cutting and stitching and screwing I put my body through because I'm because I'm searching for for validation from myself, and the only thing that, that can give me such validation it's a golden round piece of metal. You know how ridiculous is that? Mm -hmm. So there there are ways to look at it. So you it's, tell it's me I'm an accomplished athlete. You are an accomplished athlete too, man. Even maybe even more than I am. I was gonna say Brian and I were talking about this. Like Bruno must have some sort of balance that keeps him going, that 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 keeps him to be okay to be a swimmer and keep charging. Is there, is there, there's another balance in his life. There's something else out there. Obviously, your wife and your, your family, but. That was re uh, insightful, but still, what is what what does balance you when you're not swimming? What what are you out of the pool if anything? Are you? I mean, I see your tattoos. Is is that passion? Is it art? Is it an expression? What what, what what's who's Bruno Fratus? Not the swimmer, Bruno. That's that's the pursuit of dopamine. The tattoos, tattoos gives you dopamine. Yeah, you just, yeah, yeah. You just yeah. get a tattoo high <laughs> whenever whenever you're plenty and you're healing and you're looking in the yeah. mirror and you feel more like yourself and you feel badass. That's pure dopamine in your bloodstream. I love it. <laughs> but but it helps a lot to have Michelle by my side as my coach because then then swimming becomes what we do, not just part of my day. Uh, I understand there are swimmers who like to disconnect from swimming and that helps them. For me, it helps to become as connect, as much connected as I can mm -hmm. because then swimming in sports, it's not only something I do, but it's what I am. You know, I am an Olympian. I am a competitor. I am a racer. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like I kind of like the vibe, you know. Yeah. I like I like to feel I like to feel in a rocky training footage every day in my life, you know. So having my wife involved and having my entire day revolving around swimming and performing and racing, it's uh, I understand it's the opposite of balance, but it's something that makes me makes me whole and makes me feel makes me feel good about what I do. And of course, there are moments of meditation during my day where I'm with my dogs, I go to the beach, I just, but those moments are just off, off times. You know, those moments are just what I do when I'm not training. And there, I think of these moments as, as part of recovery. You know, so I like, I like to think I'm, I'm training 24 hours, seven days a week. You mentioned Michelle as uh, your coach and highly involved in your training and all that. Obviously, that's got to take a special relationship. Um, the only other real couple that comes to mind was Katinka and her relationship with her boyfriend, um, maybe husband, I've, I'm not sure. And obviously, mm -hmm. that got a bunch of media attention and, and had its issues. Could you tell us a little bit more about you and Michelle's relationship as it comes to swimming? Yeah, she, she took a step ahead when she when she proposed to be the coach of her program, uh, I was training solely with Brad back in 2016. That's when he needed to take a special, I even better focus on the college team. And uh, it's that moment after the Olympic games that pretty much every single pro group in the United States just dissolves itself. And then we rearrange a year or so later. So that will happen in Auburn. We had a great group at Auburn. It was me, Marcelo Carrigini, Felipe Lima, and uh, Renzo was there too for for some time. So it was a really good group. But as it always happens, uh, it just dissolved it dissolved itself in the in the end of 2016. And I, me and Michelle, we didn't really want it to go back to to Brazil, right? We had green cars at the time. Now we're both uh, American citizens. We just we just became last year. So yeah, USA. Sick. Yeah. And uh, and um, yeah. So we didn't want to come back. I mean, I love Brazil, of course, but we just got really adapted and we really love the American lifestyle. 
and that all the values and everything it means to be American. So we just Did I get rid of the immigrant it, mentality. It has to do with the immigrant mentality, man. Yeah, I do believe it's a country made by immigrants, and uh, yeah, totally. You, and, uh, what was that? I was going to ask about the American, your, your Americanism, um, and, and, and lo- a small shift in gear. What do you think of, why didn't you swim in the NCAA system? And, and do you regret that? And do you wish you could jump in with, with those boys in, in the NCs? Yes, the I, wish, I, w- I wish I had swum the, hmm. in the NCA, but uh, I apparently I wasn't fast enough to be recruited when I was younger. <laughs> So I'm I'm kind of a, a I'm kind of a late bloomer, you know, in every single in every single aspect. I mean, I got my first Olympic medal when I was 32. <laughs> most swimmers, most swimmers at 32, they're fat and bald. And I was still going. Yeah, I went through a fat phase. <laughs> yeah, right? I think I think that's a, I think that's a priority when you when you stop swimming when you become a swimmer you just want to go fat as fast as you can just want to eat everything in front of you. But uh, yeah, I was talking about Michelle and uh, we decided not to come back to Brazil and find solutions in the United States. I thought about going to California with uh, with another coaches and I was looking for programs around the around the country, but it was a little bit of that uh, post Olympic vibe where pros weren't really doing anything. I mean, the vast majority of pros were just retiring after games. So Michelle just raised her hand and said, hey, I'm going to coach you. I was like, for real? I mean, you're not, you're not messing with me? You're not kidding? She's like, no, no, I can do it. I've been watching your, your, I've been watching your racing forever. I've been watching your training forever. Michelle is an Olympian herself. She yeah. went to Beijing. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was a pretty, fast, a pretty fast one too. And uh, yeah, it's been successful since then. At the beginning, Brad really helped us developing the program and writing workouts and kind of teaching us how to how to develop something that made sense. And nowadays, it's just me, her, and uh, and a few other staff members. But it's it's basically me and her. Hey, earlier, uh, you when you mentioned Michelle, you said my coach, also my mm-hmm. wife. Uh, how how often does that order get mixed up? And have you ever had issues or conflict arise when you you misunderstood? What, was she your wife or was she your coach in that moment? Uh, yeah, we went through the terrible mistake of trying to separate things. Oh. And uh, that just doesn't work, man. <laughs> that just doesn't work. I mean, you just have I just have to be the swimmer and the husband yeah. every day, at least for us. I mean, I'm not saying that's the rule of thumb. That's the rule of thumb. But uh, at least for us, that's how it works. I do have to be the swimmer and the husband every day, every time. And she needs to be the, the coach and the wife every day, every time. I understand that for um, that's uh, for a classic setup of coach and athlete and for husband and wife, that would never work. But we try to be as far from classic as possible. I mean, classic is just boring. We try to be a little more excited than that. I like that. Hey, Bruno, talk to me about you, – you've gone through stuff. We asked Katie Ledecky this. Again, you, you, you've gone through a few eras of, of, of legends of sprinting, um, including yourself, of course. But, you know, from the season, Fred start off. You know, and then, you know, the floor yourself um, and now with um, Caleb and now we see a new generation coming. That's exciting, you know, with Jordan and these and Crooks. Um, what do you see out there now that's exciting to you as a 50 freestyler? You see these kids going fast and you're like, that's exciting. I like that. That, that I, I, It may not work for me, but that's exciting to see. Comment us on what you think is cool. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Um, of course, it's, it's nice to have fresh blood in the pool, but I mean, as a racer, as a good shark, I, I always looking for blood, I always I chasing know. blood. So, I mean, it's just, uh, I love to have the kids racing. I love to have Flo racing. I love to have Caleb race, racing. I love to have everybody racing. And I hope everybody's to the best of their, of their performance on top shape uh, when race time comes. But there's nothing really, really exciting. You know, I think, 
closest to exciting I can see is that sprinters are starting to to prepare themselves like actual sprinters, you know. And it's also crazy that the best sprinter, uh, the best sprinter on this last years, the the best sprinter lately, it's not really a sprinter. So that makes yeah. us think a lot. I mean, if you see Caleb, Caleb can race. I mean, he can race a phenomenal 50 freestyler, 50 freestyle. But he's not specifically a sprinter, right? So if you get if you get me, Van Proud, and Flo, we are sprinters. We race the 50, and if we needed to race a 70 meter freestyle, we would have trouble. <laughs> but uh, Caleb can do it all. He can do hundreds. He can do two hundreds. I mean, I don't doubt. I don't doubt that if you put him to swim a, a four hundred, he could race it. And the same way that I think that someone who haven't discovered the fifty freestyle yet, it's Kyle Chalmers. Mm-hmm. I think Kyle could be swimming twenty one mids year round, but he maybe it's not just exciting to him. But uh, that's uh that's the exciting part for me is to is to figure this this things out right because I mean right now I think right now I think I train like a sprinter I do believe I train like a sprinter but I cannot wait until a few years from now when I'm proven wrong and I and I get a few more answers about it. So what is it that's your biggest opportunity? You know, you've got a lot of consistency. It sounds like you've dialed in training and you know when things are going well, but what are you working on? What's going to take it to the next level? The key to consistency is consistency. If you want to be consistent racing, you need to be consistent training every day. You need to be consistent on your sleep, on your diet, on your preparation, on your weights. As a sprinter, uh, the rate, the weight room is just as important as the swimming pool. And then sleeping is just as important. The dieting is just as important. I like to be shizzled when I race. I like to have like 5% body fat when I race. That makes me feel confident. If you look good, you feel good, right? Either because, even because when you sit on the ley line and you flex the camera, you want to look good. You don't want to look like a, a chubby soft dude. You don't look, want to look like a soy boy. You want to look big and ripped, right? <laughs> but yeah, there's a, it's, it's consistency in every single aspect of, of your life. So Do that's, you learn that's from other sports? The key to it. Do you huh? learn from track? A year ago, we had Gary Hall and Arthur Waldo on. So we had a legendary track and a track sprinter and a legendary swimming sprinter. We had them on just talking pure sprinting, exactly what you're talking about. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot of repetition in, in your philosophy and their philosophy, especially in track. Do you learn from track and how they handle the 100, perhaps? How they train for the 100? I, uh, the guy who works with my, my biomechanic analysis from racing, he he comes from from gymnastics, mm. and he also works with uh, with track athletes. And my physiologist, he comes from uh, from track, also. Yeah. So I do I do have a little bit of um, of uh, a meeting point, yeah. That kind but of it's not it's not something it's not something I obsess about, no. Mm. Okay. I think at this point in my career, swimming or racing just became something I do and something I, I really enjoy doing. You know, after so much time, I don't I don't think I want to stress about it anymore. I don't want to overthink it. Uh, I just want to be happy doing whatever I'm doing and having fun racing. And eventually, things are going to work out. And uh, yeah, love that, Bruno. We got. Got a few rapid fire questions for you before we let you go. All right. What's the hardest race in swimming? The 53. Olympic gold or world record? Olympic gold. How much money have you spent on all your tattoos? I don't know. I get a bunch of them for free. I have really good friends who are the best tattoo artists in Brazil. So it's a, it's a, good, it's a good relationship to have. What's the best swimming performance you've ever seen live? Best swimming performance I've ever seen live? I saw Nick Santos going 22-4, 
50 in a 50 fly that I think was the most effortless effortless swim I ever seen. Man, that guy was so explosive. I remember watching him do starts and just oh geez. Um, yes. Do you do you pee in the pool? Oh yeah. Why do you do, think? Do you, do you ever do you ever notice that peeing in the pool and peeing at the pool, it's pretty much the same thing and it's so different at the same time. <laughs> Wait, what do you what do you mean? You're like like peeing on deck? <laughs> yeah, like if you're standing on deck and you pee directly on the pool, it's exactly the same thing that peeing in the pool. Yet they're two very different things. Think about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll actually never forget being a club team swimmer, and uh, this the my buddy's older brother would stand in the gutter. You know, some of those pools are like, they're kind of infinity yeah. pool. You stand in the gutter. He would stand in the gutter in his aqua blade jammer and just pee right there. Standing outside, just pee in his suit. But he's like, oh, it's fine. It's going in the pool. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very territorial swimmer. Raise <laughs> <laughs> a leg up. Oh With his God. leg up, yeah, he raises his leg and pee a lot. I'll, I'll respect him for trying doing that. Hey, you brought up Ben Proud. Why does Ben Proud always look like he's getting ready for spring break? I don't know, man. The guy is just massive. Oh, <laughs> uh, what's your cheat meal during the off season? Does your marriage have a cheat day? <laughs> <laughs> Why would your program have a cheap meal? I love it. Love it. When, when will we see a sub 20 second long course meter 50 freestyle and will it happen in your lifetime? A sub 20 second or a sub 21 second? Sub 20, we've already seen sub 21. When does sub 20 happen? Oh yeah, I thought, ah, because, ah, nah, that, that rubber suit thing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but I get what you're saying. I have no idea, man. I do need I do I do think we need the the rubber suits back though. Why? Cuz we struggle as a sport. Man. Actually, we don't struggle as a sport. We struggle as a product. Yeah. Hmm. There's no way in the world someone who's not into swimming would ever yeah. stop and watch a swim meet the way it is right now. I mean, look at the stands. It's all like former swimmers and uh, mm -hmm. parents. Yeah. That's depressive. Right. We're never gonna make any money off of it. So, so I think I, I think I think the rubber suits the, the rubber suits would add a level of, of excitement to the whole thing. What else would you Plus change? Make me look cut. I look nice and ripped enough in a full body suit still, so we're good. <laughs> I mean, that will make me not need to be as yeah. as cut. Five percent. <laughs> yeah, I could be a little. Instead of being five percent, I could be seven. <laughs> <laughs> oh man what I else it. what else i think what else i think it could change yeah oh man i don't want to lose any friends but <laughs> okay, won't I, love, I love my distance friends i love them all they're great people <laughs> we know where you're going but i i don't think i don't dude i don't think we can afford to have a 15 minute race no but dude nobody nobody has time to see it in front of television and spend 15 minutes of their day watching a race that at some point you don't even know who's coming and who's going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> even when you watch football and yeah. you have the downs, how long is it down? Which is so funny. When you watch, when you watch, when you watch basketball, how long until you ask for, for a timeout? Yeah. It's not 15 minutes, man. Nobody has time to be on in front of television for 15 minutes and watch like people swimming slow. Yeah. <laughs> because I mean, if you're if you're swimming, that doesn't feel slow. But if you're watching from the outside, that that yeah. looks slow. Yeah. So boring. Yeah. So we need. I, I do. I do think any anything beyond 400 meters, just send them to open water. It can be good for both sports. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, like, I, I do think I also think that open water could use it because I mean, yeah. they only have one race and they kind of struggle with uh with public, also. Yeah, yeah. So, the whole sport of swimming, the whole act of swimming activity of swimming is kind of struggling with it. So, we we could like help each other and bring bring 50 strokes to 
to the Olympics. I mean, four mm-hmm. by 50 freestyle, mm-hmm. four by 50 medley, you know, just make it exciting and explosive. Put fireworks and, uh, and flamethrowers around the pool, stuff like that. <laughs> You know? would, I love you it. Keep it long course? Would you keep it long course or you you could introduce short course? Of course, I keep it long course, man. I'll have my butt kicked if I do short course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. I love it. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't know. I, don't, I think, I don't know, maybe maybe something in the middle, you know, yeah. because, because when you're a short course, you have 25 meters and you allow athletes to go 15 meters underwater. I mean, it's a third of the, it's two thirds of the race underwater right. where you're not seeing anything. You're looking yep. to a, you're looking to a, to a stale swimming pool. Yep. Motionless. <laughs> For two thirds of the race, you're just staring at water. <laughs> so it, it's pointless. And for yeah. you to have an actual race, it needs to be two lengths of the pool. And I do think we need, we need, uh, we need a race where you just go one length because hey, nobody wants to see who can who whoever can pace better. People want to see who who's the fastest, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. you need to have one one lap. You need a twenty five free. That's what we need. Twenty five free. Anyway, yeah, twenty five twenty five free is fun, but not if you spend two thirds in the of the race. Underwater, inside the yeah, water. you gotta pop up the water. Yeah, it makes no sense. <laughs> like so yeah, that. we need. I mean. It's just crazy ideas, but I don't know. Skill skill competitions is like All Star Weekend stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we need we need someone thinking outside the box. Yeah, I agree. Okay. You know, remember when I think I think it was Brett who did with his podcast a fifty kick challenge, and that thing yep, just yep, it was awesome. exploded yep. on the internet. Yep. We need stuff like that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The same boring thing we've been doing for over a hundred yeah. years is just not working anymore. Agreed. Yeah. If if it ever did, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, but you can see the Winter Olympics have pivoted that way, too, because watching the last Winter Olympics, it was like the X Games. I mean, I couldn't find speed skating. I couldn't find cross-country skiing. Nobody, they don't care anymore. All they show is so what all the kids want to see. We can, put, we can put an airbag right underneath the starting block. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, now, now finally is the answer for why we're swimming and diving combined in college swimming it's like yes there we're you go just, hey just throw the swimmers in the water oh my god Smash them. i love it bruno thanks well, for hanging out with us man it was super fun yeah, to chat with you dude. i appreciate you guys inviting me yeah all right guys that's it for this episode of social kick we'll see you next time All right. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram.